grace to you and peace from God our Father and His Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know how arguments go? The ones when you fight over little things that there's really not a good argument for. You know, you know, I like chocolate ice cream the best. It's definitely best. Oh, no, no, no. I am definitely a fan of vanilla. Vanilla is better. Oh, no, chocolate. No, vanilla. No, chocolate. No, vanilla. You know how that goes. And then you see that third-party person showing up, and you're like, oh! And you sidle right up to him, and you go, I know you just love chocolate ice cream, don't you? And, of course, they say, well, of course! And, and you won now, right? Oh, yes, you won the truth is, all you did was manipulate the right answer out of that person, right? They had no idea what you're asking or talking about. It's all a little bit manipulative. And that's what we have happening today in our gospel reading. Jesus has been sort of standing up on his own against several different attacks, but this one is a little more subtle. The Sadducees, they come to Jesus, and we're told that they do not believe in the resurrection. And I did a little research. Apparently, the Sadducees didn't believe in anything that wasn't in the first five books of the Bible. They wanted to keep things pure, and so they only listened to the law of Moses. So they don't believe in the resurrection, because that's not really mentioned in those first five books. For them, you lived, you died, that was the end of the story. And one of the reasons they felt that way is because they really wanted people to focus on the life they have in the here and now. And they didn't want people to be distracted or bogged down by ideas about the future. So they didn't believe that there was any life after this one. And so they come to Jesus with what is likely their go-to argument story question. And it's probably the question they pull out every time they get into a discussion or an argument with other people. Um, especially with people who don't agree with them, which at this time was most people. Most people thought there was some kind of an afterlife. And so they hear Jesus is answering questions, they're going to try it out on him. And so they tell this strange story about this woman marrying seven brothers. Now remember, these are people who don't believe the resurrection exists. So this question is kind of offered very sarcastically, a little tongue-in-cheek, and maybe kind of of the mindset of like, I mean, how dumb can you really be to believe this stuff, right? So there's this poor woman, and she gets married to each of seven brothers in turn. And then they all die without having kids, and she dies too. And so their question is, you know, she's married to all these guys, all of them in good faith. So when she's resurrected, whose wife is she? How is this scenario going to play out? Who's going to get the girl in the end? Is it the first brother, the last brother, the one who loved her the most? See all these problems that happen when you talk about resurrection? It can't possibly be real. That's sort of what their their take on this is. Now, as Christians, we are used to hearing about resurrection. After all, it is the center of our faith. Jesus' death and resurrection assure us of our salvation and promise us a life after this one. And we experience little resurrections all the time through the forgiveness of our sins, and we look forward to the day when we will no longer face death. But what do we actually know about resurrection? And does the Sadducees' question today make us ponder what we think we know? I mean, how important are the logistics, really? The Bible offers us a lot of images about the resurrection, but no facts or hard proof. We have images of a great feast, of this world made newer and better, of a throne room where people worship God continually, of a city on a hill that's sparkling with light, and so many other images When we think about resurrection, what do we imagine? What do we think it will look like? Does one of those images work for us or something totally different? How about those logistics? Does resurrection happen the second you die or do you have to wait for Jesus' final return? Is it for everybody or just some people? Do we know those that we've known all our lives once we've been resurrected? Do we get that 
perfect body back that we thought we had once upon a time, or is it totally different? There's so many questions. And when we think about them, sometimes we can get a little bogged down. The details don't all make sense, or they don't make sense the way that we comprehend it. And then we begin to wonder if any of it makes sense. At the same time, we find ourselves in a world that is, well, far from perfect. We watch as hatred and division become commonplace in our lives. We stand by as people go hungry and live without basic needs. We add to our world's destruction. We fill our lives with the things that are best for us, but maybe not for other people. We face uncertainty and hopelessness. And we know that we are called to help. We are called to make a difference in our world, to show God's love, to build God's kingdom, to be the change that God would like to see in our broken world. So where where should our focus really be? The Sadducees were worried that people would forget about this world as they waited for the next world coming world. And we can sometimes do the same. We can sometimes allow the problems of this world to pass us by as we wait for something better in the resurrection. Or sometimes we fall into the opposite trap. Living so much in the here and now, focused on making the world a better place, that we forget that our final hope is in the resurrection. That through Jesus' death and resurrection, we are given the promise of new life. A life that we may know very little about and can't see until we actually get there. But a promise nonetheless. It's a difficult conundrum. Should, we, should our focus be on this life or should it be on the afterlife? The Sadducees couldn't find a way to include both, and so they wrote off the resurrection. But Jesus does not. Jesus says, we can't begin to understand what the resurrection will truly be like. Marriage as we know it will make no sense then. Relationships as we know it will be different. The questions we think are so important about the resurrection will in some ways have no meaning when we actually get there. But then Jesus goes on because he actually does disagree with what the Sadducees have to say. Jesus says there is indeed a resurrection. Jesus knows there is more to life after death. And so he speaks to those leaders in a way that they will understand. He uses scripture that they recognize. He goes to the book of Exodus and he talks about how God is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And the logic here is actually pretty neat. I mean, it is Jesus, so you would expect that. But but Jesus says God is not a God of the dead. God is God of the living. And so if he is the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, then they must be alive as well. They must be resurrected. God is the God of the living. What an incredible proclamation. God is the God of the living. God is the God of us. All of us who are living and breathing and working and playing. All of us who are speaking out against injustice in our world. All of us who are making our corners of the world just a little bit brighter. And God is the God of the living. God is the God of those who have gone before us. All those whose names we read last week on All Saints Sunday, all those who have given their lives for faith or for freedom, all those who now live the resurrection. So this life or the afterlife? Where should our focus be? The answer is God is the God of the living, both our living and the resurrected living, both our work here and now and that final promised resurrection. God 
is the God of the living. And so perhaps that question about this life or the next life, maybe it's better as a statement. This life and the next life. With God as our living God, we have the ability to live in the here and the now and also to hope in the promise of the resurrection to come. God is the God of the living, and we are living. Amen.